Hi everybody, can you hear me okay? I'm sure most of you in this audience will have heard of Dallas, seen one of his programs before. So I was gonna say, for those of you who don't know me, what I should say is I'm a molecular biologist and I do a bit of science communication. So in this context, I get the best seat in the house for answering the questions, uh, asking the questions to Dallas about how to communicate science. Okay. Um, so, first question. Dallas, mm. you should probably remember this, but like, how did you first get into science communication and broadcasting? It's a good question. I, I so, so I'm not a molecular biologist. I should I should say from the from the outset, uh, and in fact, I'm not a scientist at all. And people are always slightly confused, I think, when when they meet me because generally, when you see science on television, it's done by scientists. It's done by Professor Brian Cox, oh, or it's done by Professor Alice Roberts, or it's done by Richard Dawkins, whoever it, whoever it is. It's generally scientists telling you stuff. I actually started, started working in, uh, this is, you know, 30 years ago, I actually started off uh, working in drama. So I trained as an, uh, I worked as an, as an actor uh, doing drama for, for, for a while. I wasn't a very good actor because I was an actor who, uh, instead of reading Stanislavski, and such, I ended up, I spent too much time reading New Scientist, because I was always really interested in science, about how the world works and how nature works. I just wasn't a scientist. I'm just, in the same way that I love listening to music, but I'm a, I don't play music. You know, or I like watching sport, but I don't actually play the sport. But for somehow, I was always really confused that science is somehow sort of other. Like, why is it that if you're interested in science, people just kind of assume you must be a scientist? Anyway, I was living in America at the time, and uh, I was in a bar, uh, the short stop it was, I remember very clearly, uh, with my friend Jonathan. And we were having just a, a discussion about this, about science. And we were both actors. We both weren't involved in science or academia at all. And we, were, and we had this conversation. We were like, well, how come, why is it only scientists get to talk about science? Mm. Why, you know, why, 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 why don't we, we should do a show rather than Professor Ganesh telling you stuff. I've, I've been promoted uh, in the last 10 minutes. Telling you all about molecular biology. Why don't we get like an idiot to go and like find stuff out, like a kind of bottom up mm. kind of science show. And th this was 2003, oh, actually early 2001. So this is a long, long time ago. So anyway, we came up with this, this sort of science show idea, which was, and we thought, well, who's the idiot? Well, I'll do it because I'm really bad at science. I don't have any science qualifications. I failed all my science O levels, et cetera, et cetera. And so we did this show um, and we managed to sell it to the Discovery Channel, like bizarrely. We were like, okay, so we got to make the show for the Discovery Channel. And the premise of the show was each week Dallas goes on a mission to try and do an impossible thing. And it was called Dallas in Wonderland. And so, the, so mission one was this week I'm going to break the men's 100 meters record. You know, and then this week I'm going to journey to the center of the earth. And then this week I'm going to get abducted by aliens. And so by not being able to do the thing each week, you learn about the thing. So for example, the 100 meters episode we did, you know, by me trying to do this ridiculous task, which is right. quite clearly I'm not going to be able to do it. But you learn all about sports science. You learn about sports psychology. You learn about biomechanics right. and training and all this kind of stuff. And it was actually a really good, it was a good show. But we, we were obsessed by, it was right when The Life Aquatic came out. You know, the, the um, uh, what, who directed The Life Aquatic? You know, Wes Anderson, yeah. And I was really obsessed by, by that film, by like the aesthetics of that film. Um, and Bill Murray in that film. And, and I, I really like the idea of just like a bunch of idiots kind of having adventures and, you know, which is what that film is about. But also it's in that kind of Wes Anderson way, beautifully shot, wonderful color palettes. And the music was really amazing. And I remember the, 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 the band Devo, who are this 80s pop band, some of you will remember Devo, the, the, the lead singer, of, well, one of the members of Devo, Mark Mothersbaugh, does a lot of music and does all the music for Wes Anderson's films. And I was looking at the sleeve notes of The Life Aquatic, and I noticed that Mark Mothers had done the music. And I'm like, we, we totally want that kind of music for our show, for our right. Discovery show, because we want it to feel a bit like The Life Aquatic. And I noticed that, but just by reading the sleeve notes, that he had a recording studio just down the road from where we were living. So, we, you know, this is on Hollywood Boulevard. It was the old Rocky Bullwinkle Museum. And so I thought, fuck it, I'm going to go. And we I drove down this. there. I remember knocking on the door oh my gosh, and I he answered. This. And I'm like, listen, this is ridiculous. Oh we're doing God. this show for Discovery. We've been meeting composers, and, but we're, oh, and we're, all we've been saying is we want someone a bit like Mark Mothersbaugh. And eventually he sort of did the music for us. Love it. So we were, but we were a bit arch for Discovery. Huh. We were a bit kind of, it was a bit, what, I think we were, I don't know. We, we got fired after one season of doing this, <laughs> of doing this thing. We were, 
and we were ejected back to the UK for being too um, too avant-garde. Well, I don't think we were being avant-garde, but they were like they were like the, the, the execs were like, could you do like a Shark Week episode? Like it was when Discovery were all about you know they wanted Shark Week every week, and and, and we weren't really that. We Dallas were... gets eaten by a anyway, shark. Anyway, so that was the answer. So that so that's kind of where it started, and then after that I came back to the UK, and then I went from there. you know having done that show and having sort of created that idea of like idiot tries to go on tries to find stuff out then we then i did you know stuff i joined the bbc well i, I did the gadget show for a while and then the bbc oh, that's cool. yeah i mean it, there's two things that come into my mind in that there's one thing that you talked about which is the aesthetic of the show in, in itself like the sort of quirky side of yeah. thing. let's park that for a second i think it sounds an awful lot like actually the fact that you um basically as a non-expert sorry Oh, I am um, a non-expert. Yeah. But I think that actually might be part of the appeal, it sounds like. like do you feel like that's what you brought to, to these sorts of Definitely. things? Definitely. I think it's really important. When, you know, when we're talking about science, science still is seen as other people do science. So if you're not connected to science yeah. or academia, science is something else. And, and, and I think that's, well, A, it's a shame because science is too interesting just to be left to, for scientists yeah. to talk about. Yeah, and B, also, it's really important for the general populace not just to, obviously, you know, to be educated in, in what science is and how science works, but also just because it's interesting, because science is just intrinsically an interesting thing to talk yeah. about, how the world works, how nature works, why things are the way they are, the things that we don't understand, which are, you know, mm. for me, infinitely more interesting than the things that we do understand. Yeah. And that's like, like any other form of human culture, science should be, should be there for everyone. And we, you know, you mentioned Van Gogh's a theory. We, you know, we got to do this family science show on BBC One. And, you know, the reason I was on that show, you know, we had, you know, academics as well. So we had Liz Bonin on it and we had Jem Stansfield and we had Yan Wong. And my role was the kind of, you know, again, the sort of every man. It's like me yeah. not being an expert, asking questions. I, 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 in a way, I had the license to ask the stupid questions because you know, when you become a professor, it suddenly becomes harder to ask oh. the stupid questions. I but mean, for me, it's okay to ask the stupid questions. Yeah, I mean, we, there's a whole separate talk to be had about why it's not acceptable for some people to ask questions, whereas for but others... But it shouldn't be. It's ridiculous. It shouldn't, it's, it shouldn't it, be like that. We have, a really, we have a really silly culture of, yeah. of, of, of how we talk about science still. Yeah. And, our, you know, our, our, you yeah. know, our whole mantra of Bango's a theory was like taking science out of the lab and into people's lives yeah. and actually you know, giving people permission to feel like they're allowed to talk about science. Because um, I think, certainly for me, you know, years ago, I, I felt, oh shit, science, I'm not allowed to kind yeah. of, that's, not, that's, that's something else. Yeah. I mean, you've also talked about questions, right? So do you feel like, do you think, what came first, do you think, your curiosity about science or the fact that once you got into it, it becomes that much, like you just, there's always a why, the moment you're told any kind of scientific thing, I think. It's a good question. I, um, I think when I was at school doing science, I just didn't, it's not that I didn't get it, I didn't want to get it because I, I saw science as the, the thing that those people did, you know, and I was too busy listening to the these, Smiths. These people. Yeah, I was, you know, I was <laughs> the Smiths because it was the 1980s, so I was listening to the Smiths and science was sort of over there yeah. somewhere. And it wasn't until, I guess, probably until my sort of early 20s. I mean, but, but then again, you know, even though Science was over there. I, I grew up watching BBC Science. I used to love watching Tomorrow's World. You know, I was fascinated by that. I used to love watching, like everyone, I watched David Attenborough and I watched, you know, connections with James Burke. And, you know, I grew up watching, you know, Apollo stuff happening because I'm, I'm of that age. So that was, that was all in the background. And I found, I found all that world very interesting, but I just didn't associate it with, you know, learning science. I didn't yeah. want to be a scientist. Yeah. In the same way that I like listening to Beethoven and I don't want to be a pianist, that's okay. Um, so yeah, so uh, some, I, I guess I think sometime in my early twenties, actually, I I chanced upon. Actually, it was the Royal Institution Christmas Lectures in I think it was ninety one or ninety two, and there was this guy presenting it whose name was Richard Dawkins. So this was a long time ago. I know I know <laughs> people's hackles will raise. I, you know, but let's park that for a moment. Um, <laughs> But I remember Richard Dawkins, this young, you know, rather attractive sort of professor, just talking very eloquently about evolution. And I never, I didn't really understand how, I, you know, yeah. I, like everyone else, I kind of, I, I sort of 
had a basic grasp of it, but I didn't really understand it. And he just explained it so beautifully, so, so simply, so elegantly. I remember watching this Christmas lecture and it was like the windows opening and this yeah. kind of draft coming in. I was like, why did no one, exp- I, it's so interesting. Why the hell did no one tell me that when I was at school? Yeah. So I became really, really fascinated by, by that. And I remember reading, soon after that, I read The Blind Watchmaker, one of his books, absolutely fascinating. And then I did a, I worked with a director, this guy, Ken Campbell, and I sort of helped him on a, he was doing a series called Reality on the Rocks, which is a, like my own sort of idea. Ken Campbell tries to go on a mission to try and understand quantum mechanics. And so I got really interested in the kind of that world of crazy stuff we don't understand. And, 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 and so, yeah, I just became really so that interested is- in the whys and the, and the hows and the... To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.